wife said, Jasmine turned me on, but I'm not sure I should say that in church. All right. But since my wife said it, all right, I'm going to I'm gonna get away with it. All right. Uh, I, I, we were setting up chairs, all right? We had folks looking for a place to sit. So that's a good challenge to have on a Sunday morning, isn't it? Particularly in July, that's a great problem to have. Good morning. Good to see you all. Thanks for being here today. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July. Uh, how many of you felt a couple of tremors this week? All right. Anybody not feel either one of them? God bless you, all right? See uh, and, and you, you had nothing to worry about, and those of you who felt them, you shouldn't have worried either, all right? There wasn't one thing you could do about them, all right? So there's no reason to worry about them, and if you know Jesus, you know where you're going. If this was the end, and if it's not, he still has something in store for us. So uh, anyway, I did find out this week that uh, we have a family whose daughter lives in Ridgecrest, her and her husband there. And so uh, they've been very fortunate. They certainly felt it, but uh, no significant damage or loss. So we're grateful for that. A few folks have mentioned to me today, they've got friends and folks who live in that area. And we certainly want to be praying for them and all that's going on in this world. Um, the East Coast has hurricanes. Uh, the central part of the U.S. has tornadoes. And we occasionally have earthquakes, all right? So uh, this is I don't want to get preachy right at the beginning of church, but you see, this is all Adam and Eve's fault, okay? If it wasn't for the fall in the garden, all right, this world wouldn't be impacted by the, the, the negative thing called sin, all right? And as a result, everything has its, uh, has its challenges. But that being said, welcome today. Great to have you at New Hope. There are communication cards in the pew in front of you, all right? I'm going to hold it up right now, all right? There's a communication card. It looks like this if you're in one of the pews. Uh, if you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence, and I would love for you to take it and fill out the side that's a, the brown or beige side. Uh, I usually say put this in the offering bag, but we have something new starting today. I don't know if any of you, as you walked in the front door, if you noticed a welcome sign, all right, just to the left as you came in. That's a welcome booth, all right? And uh, somebody's going to be manning that booth every Sunday so we can give directions to folks who show up the first time and don't know where to go. If they have kids or high school students, the right areas to direct them to. Uh, also, if you take this card and instead of putting it in the offering bag, which you're welcome to do today, or on your way out, stop by that booth, give them the guest card, and they're going to give you choice of about three or four different gifts, all right, that you have to choose from. So we'll exchange the card for a gift. We're not going to ask for another thing, all right? And we make a promise. We do not come knock on your door. We do not call you on the phone with this information, but through the mail, We'll send you information that tells you about the church, what we believe, who our staff is, the kind of ministries and opportunities we have, hopefully answer most of your questions, and we are happy to do that. Also at that booth back there, we have some new international version Bibles. If you're new attending church and you don't have a Bible and would like one, we've got one for you there as well. All right? So uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. The other side of the Connect card are for our regular attenders. If you have messages to the staff, if you have prayer requests, updates, if you're changing your moving and you've got new updated information, please put that on here so we can update our system and uh, drop that in the offering as it comes by. May I direct your attention to the screen this morning for our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Church. My name is Doug Cecil with the Elder Board. We just wanted to thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. Hello, seniors. Come celebrate the 4th of July with us at the Seniors Luncheon on Tuesday, July 9th. We will enjoy a delicious catered lunch from Luna's. We will again be writing cards to honor and show our appreciation for our Clovis veterans. We will celebrate our country's independence and rejoice over our dependence on Christ. All of this for just $5. Signups are going around, so please let us know if you will be there. And if you've never attended a seniors luncheon before, please join us for this wonderful celebration. Our July men's breakfast is on July 13th. Coffee will be on at 7.30, we'll eat at eight, and this month we'll be having barbecue breakfast burrito. Hope to see you there. Jeff and Cindy Eidson are gonna be doing a Tuesday night Bible study starting on July 16th. This is a six week study called the DNA of joy. And it ties in really well with what Pastor Tim has been doing on Sunday mornings. So it's July 16th, starting at 6.30 in the bridge. 
Ladies, our next book clubs start the week of July 22nd. If you haven't joined one yet and you're interested, go to our church website, click on Women's Ministry, and it'll take you to the book clubs. You pick out the one that best suits your needs and call that group leader. Come and join us for lots of fun reading this summer. Our VBS is one week away. The Mr. J Band will be presenting There's a Monster Under My Bed. So get your little monsters signed up now through our website. Also, if you've signed up to volunteer or you'd like to volunteer for VBS, there's a meeting right after the third service today. Well, good morning. I just want to take one more opportunity to remind you of a very special date coming up. It's September the 15th. It is Build the Barn Day. We are going to be having a barbecue and I have sampled the brisket. It is phenomenal. You're going to enjoy the evening. It's a time for us to invite our neighbors, our friends, business leaders here in town, uh, anybody that we can think of that New Hope has had an impact on, and they can help us build a barn. We've got silent auction items. We're going to have live auction items. And we hope that our ground has already had the first shovel put into it as we start the new building project. We hope you'll put that date on your calendar. Think of who you can invite. Come spend the evening together. Um, okay, so we'll start with, uh, welcome to New Hope. Nope, that's bad. Um, so my name is Doug Cecil with the, with the um, good morning and welcome to New Okay. I can hear you, John. We wanted to thank you for coming and, and the, we just wanted to thank you for coming in and worshiping with the, we wanted to thank you for coming and worshiping with, with us today. That's a hard word to put together. And if you are a guest today and wondering what all that at the end was about, uh, those are sort of the uh, cuts of preparing a greeting from our elder board. We've been trying to introduce our church family to all of our elders uh, over the last few months, and so they've been doing the greetings. And for some reason, when the camera turns on, the smiles go away and the brains go dead. All right? <laughs> And uh, so some of them have been quite humorous, all right? And so that was Doug Cecil, one of your newest elder board members. In fact, just elected this year. Uh, all right, let me highlight a couple of things uh, that were mentioned there and then some updates to some things that maybe you don't know about yet. Uh, let's talk about the barn event very quickly. That's going to be up September the 15th. Again, if you're new to our church, we don't talk a whole lot about this. In fact, until two weeks ago, we've said very little about the barn since January. The barn is a new building that we're going to be building. Hopefully, we get to break ground in the next month or two. Uh, it is a 150 by 60 foot building. The first one third of it will be our new offices that will get out of the triple wide trailer. And the rest of it is a multi-use facility so that we can host funeral receptions for a full sanctuary. Uh, we can have church wide events in there. It'll be our bigger venue for our eight o'clock service. It will have lots and lots of options for us. We've been a debt free church for 28 years and we want to continue to be that way. So we are raising these funds and hopefully it'll will be paid for by the time that it's built. Uh, our church family, we launched this building project to them in October, and it was a three-month launch, and we raised 1.2 out of the 1.75 million that we need for this project. So we're two-thirds of the way there. And uh, we've been able to impact a lot of folks in this community that do not attend here, either through weddings or funerals or special events. And so if you have neighbors or friends that you think would like to come and help us build the barn, uh, they're glad that this is your home church. Uh, maybe we've done a service for them in the past. Uh, we want you to invite them to come to that event. Now, this is the caution. The barbecue is free. So I don't know any other way to say this but being really blunt. I don't want you just showing up for the free barbecue, okay? <laughs> this is not a fellowship event for our church family, all right? This is a fundraising event. We don't do these things very often, but that's what that's night for. We Bring somebody with you, all right, that was good, that's going to take advantage of the silent auction or the live auction things. We also have a general store where uh, items can be purchased, homemade items. Most of those things will be in the general store. Uh, there's going to be live music there that night. Uh, it's going to be a fun, fun evening. You've had a, uh, a committee that's been working on this uh, since January, all right? They have been very engaged. And in fact, I'm going to get that committee out of my back pocket and I'm going to introduce them to you right now. 
And you're saying, why out of your back pocket? Because they're in an email that I have right here that I forgot to print out. All right? So here we go. Fawn Boss, stand up when I call your name. Oh, Fawn's, where is Fawn? She was, oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. All right, that's Fawn. All right. Uh, Kim Drake was in our 8 o'clock service. All right. Uh, Maureen Steinbeck, stand up. Maureen. All right. <laughs> Kathy Critchfield. All right, Marguerite McAfee, and she is not here this morning. Shelly Rowland. All right, so these are your committee members. So you can contact them if you have any questions about silent auction or live auction things. If you have things that you think would be good for a silent or live auction, please call one of them. They'll direct you to the right person to talk to. Uh, if you think you have something for the general store that would be good that's homemade, please contact Kathy. And the reason for doing that is not because we don't want it, but we don't want a lot of the same thing. So if we've already got two or three of something, uh, then we may suggest something else, all right? Uh, uh, we want this to be very efficient. We want this to be a really good evening. We've got lots of folks who are volunteering. We are also, um, and you say, Tim, you can't raise any money if it's free. Well, live and silent auction. And then the other thing we have for raising funds is this. We have event sponsors and table sponsors. And so if any of you have a business and you would like to participate as one of those, you can do that. Here's the way that works. A table sponsor, you get your name on a table, big print. You get your name on a grass flag, a yard flag, all right, that's about seven feet tall, and your name will be on one of those flags. You will be in the program for that night. You will be announced publicly that night. You'll be on a video, all right, the name of your business on a Sunday morning, and you'll be in social media, all right? So that's for a table sponsor. That's $500. Or you can be an event sponsor. And what you get with an event sponsor is all of those things, Plus, you get to reserve a table of 10 for your seating because nobody else has a reserved seat. Okay? It's a free meal. First come, first serve who show up. So if you've, you're inviting guests or people from your business, you want to reserve to make sure you're there, then cough up a 1000 bucks and you got it. All right. <laughs> So, uh, it's a very, very exciting evening for us. We've already got uh, about, uh, we've already, we just started Friday with the sponsors. We have 10 already. We're planning on 30 tables. We expect about 300. Uh, we are going to ask you when we get a few more weeks down the road to RSVP, all right, with your presence and how many guests you're bringing so that we make sure we do have enough tables. Doug Cecil, the guy who made the greeting announcement today, he is the one in charge of the brisket. Okay, brisket is not big out in California. That's a Midwestern thing. We have tri-tip. We're going to give you something different. It's smoked brisket. He did a test run last Sunday and invited Shelly and I over with a few other folks for Sunday evening. We got to sample it. 12 hours of smoke. It was phenomenal. Melt and, and for you healthy, conscious people, there is, there is lean and there is fat cuts of the meat, of the brisket, all right? Uh, I will tell you this, as most of you know, the fat cuts are the most flavorful, all right? But if you're worried about your health that night, go with a lean cut, all right? It is also very, very good. So enough said about that. Vacation Bible School starts a week from tomorrow, and uh, Mr. J will be with us. He does a great job, and they will share worship with us next Sunday morning as well. And uh, you're going to enjoy. If you have children or grandchildren that you say are going to VBS, would you do me a favor? Before the sun sets today, would you go online and register your kids or grandkids? Earlier this week, we already had 80 signups, but 60 of the 80 were not from our church, which that's a wonderful thing. We love the community. They've seen the sign out, but what that tells us is y'all wait to the last minute to sign your own kids up, and the challenge with that is making sure we have enough of all the items we need. So if you know that your kids or grandkids are going to be coming, in fact, you could pull your phone out right now, go to the, go to the website, and before I shut up, you would uh, probably have your kids registered already. It's free. There's no cost uh, for kids coming to VBS, but we would love to have them registered. Uh, let's see here. Angel Tree. They do sports camps throughout the year. It's not just the gifts that we do at Christmas for children of incarcerated parents. Another way of connecting with them and hopefully making a difference in their lives is through the sport, Angel Tree Sport Camps. We had one in Fresno last month. They're doing one in Redwood City. And uh, Joe Avila, who's in charge of the sport camps all over the United States. And by the way, 
uh, the NFL is trying to improve their image just a little bit. And so they have teamed up with Prison Fellowship Angel Tree. The NFL and the NFL alumni have teamed up. They're helping with some sponsorship, and they are providing speakers who are Christians that play currently in the NFL or have recently retired from the NFL to be at these events. So the next one is going to be the end of the month. It's the last Sunday of July. It is on a Sunday. Uh, If you would be interested in volunteering for that, they need all kinds of volunteers from registration to directing kids to actually being engaged in some of the uh, athletic events that they're doing there. Uh, I've been told it's all that's required is a pair of tennis shoes and a good attitude, and you can volunteer for that. Please either contact Joe Avila or reach out to Teddy Miller, all right? And they will direct you to uh, how you can fill out the application, become a participant in that very special event, all right? Uh, let me update you now on some prayer requests and, uh, and praise items. One, Helen Heath is sitting right here in front of me, all right? And uh, she said her surgery was a great success. She is doing very well. Thank you for your prayers and your love for her. Um, let me up. Today, just as a little out of sync. Um, Pam Murphy, her and her husband Mike are part of our church family. Quite often they sit right back over there. And uh, she is a lung cancer survivor, has been doing very well for this past year. She went in just as a follow-up test. She's feeling great. She said, quite frankly, I haven't felt better in quite some time. Uh, But going in for a follow-up test, they discovered that there is some cancer back in her system. Uh, They were able to catch it at stage one, which they are most grateful for. They said because she feels so well, if she hadn't been going in for this follow-up, it could have gotten much, much worse before they ever discovered it. So tomorrow, she'll be having surgery at Fresno Community Hospital. They'll be removing 20% of her pancreas, her spleen, and some lymph nodes. Once she has recovered from that surgery, they'll begin some kind of chemo treatment, all right, for that. Uh, Portia Luttrell, part of our church family, and Brittany, who is our junior high director. Uh, Their father and grandfather, Sam Vahilia, is in Clovis Community Hospital and ICU. All kinds of health challenges going on right now. So just be praying for him. He is 83 years old. Um, And then tomorrow, I want you to be praying for the Sagaguchi family. Uh, I'll be doing a memorial service for Paul. Paul was a dentist in Southern California, moved up here for the last 15 years of his life because his daughter uh, and husband, they are attorneys here in the area. Uh, Paul lived, he just missed it by about three days, making it to 102, okay? So uh, a wonderful, wonderful life. Very, very interesting stories as I met with his daughter, Grace. But just remember them tomorrow. And while I'm talking about people getting really, really old, uh, Dad, who happens to be in this service, he will turn 94 this coming week, all right? So you might want to wish him a happy birthday. Uh, Mike Rasmussen, a younger man that's part of our church fellowship for the last year, did not get good news from uh, follow-up to his surgery. Uh, they've estimated that unless there's something really miraculous takes place, he probably has about three months all right, to live. He's in his 40s, uh, just a delightful young man, accepted Christ in his heart in the hospital. And uh, Samantha Woodland is Karen's daughter-in-law, and they're requesting prayer for her health needs. So those are some of the updates we wanted to share with you. Um, Last Sunday, we baptized 17. Wasn't that fun? Man, in two services. Uh, That was just exciting. Um, One of my other most favorite things to do on a Sunday morning is what we're doing today, and that is we have a baby dedication. All right? And just before I do that, I forgot to send these around, so let me get these started. These are sign-up sheets. If you're a senior attending the senior luncheon on Tuesday, please sign up. If you've done that already, you don't need to sign up again. And on the bottom couple of sheets, the Bible study that the Aishans are going to teach called the DNA of Joy goes along with our Sunday sermon series. If you want to be part of that Bible study, please sign up. Those are on the bottom two pages. We'll get those going around. All right? So anyway, we have a special young man that we are going to, to honor today. He, uh, he has an older brother that we got to do this with a few years ago. Uh, oh, looky there. There he is. Uh, the Theodore Robert Bocher, all right? Uh, born just a little over a year ago. In fact, one year and one week. Robert and Jenna been part of our church uh, since really right before you married, huh? Or a little bit before that. Yeah, just a little bit before that. And uh, he's got an older brother named William David, who we did the same thing for not all that long ago. So, Bochers, would you bring up that, bring up both your boys, all right? 
uh, and it's the smaller, the shorter one that we're going to be uh, dedicating today. And you have some family and friends with you here today, right? Why don't you have them stand up real quick? You don't have to come forward, but just stand up. Eee, all right. Good support from this family. And uh, you may be seated. Uh, we got grandparents here. All right, grandparents, why don't you come up and join them, all right? Get on each side of them if you're grandparents. We'd love to have you do that. All right. Yeah. Okay, now I'm just, I'm just taking a shot in the dark that these are probably your parents. Yeah, and these are probably your parents. Yeah, I saw the way they all went to the sides, all right? So it's kind of like choosing a sports team, all right? There we go. However, you have been unified by these two kids into one family, and that makes it very, very special. All right, uh, this little boy has got a full mouth of a name, all right, Theodore Robert Bocher. Um, what are we going to call him? Theo. Theo. All right, Theo. I like that. Uh, see, there was a Theo Epstein, wasn't there? Wasn't he an actor? I think so. All right. Um, Mom and Dad, you've been through this once before, so you probably know about what I'm going to say, and that is uh, baby dedication, really. Uh, your sons are never going to remember this day except for what you may tell them through pictures. This day really is about the two of you. Uh, the two of you and your love for each other, the two of you and your love for your sons, the two of you and your love for Christ. And that's the reason we do baby dedications in a church is because it's an expression of the parents. Number one, your gratitude for God's blessing in your life with giving you these children who are going back and forth, all right? That's the prerogative of children. Uh, number two, it's also your love for God and your recognition that with this privilege of parenthood comes the responsibility of raising them in the love of Jesus Christ, a love that is to be seen by the two of you as they see how you relate to each other as husband and wife and mom and dad, the way in which that you bring them to a place like this, all right, where in Sunday school they're going to be able to hear as the years go by about who Jesus is and the stories of the Bible. We can't force them to be a Christian, but we put them in a place where they have what they need to make that decision as they reach that age. So are you parents? who willingly express your love for Christ, your love for each other, and your desire to raise your children in the fellowship of God's family. If that is the desire of your heart today, would you say it is? Perfect. Grandparents, you have heard what your son and daughter have had to say about their children and their love for each other, their love for God, and their love to raise. He's praising the Lord already. Did you see that hand up? That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> He's pointing to the light of the world, all right? Uh, <laughs> So grandparents, are you willing to support your children and the raising of your grandchildren in a spiritual nurturing environment? If you are, would you say, we will? Yeah. Terrific. All right. Here's my favorite part. Theo, are you going to be nice and come to me today? You were going to everybody else. Will you come see me? You are such a handsome dude. Look at those blue eyes. Oh, my goodness. You are so handsome. They put the right shirt on you to match your eyes. All right, that is so very, very good. And I'm going to ask that you all join hands, all right, as we are gathered around Theo today, and we are going to pray for God's best in his life, all right? Let's pray, Theo. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the incredible gifts that you give to us. And to the Bochers, it's been fun to see them through their wedding day and through their first child and now for this most recent blessing in their life. We are grateful for who they allow you to be in them and we are so grateful for this day in which they are honoring you by recognizing this gift in their life and their willingness to give him back to you. They are going to love him and care for him and nurture him both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Thank you for the sort of support of grandparents who recognize this important relationship with you. Thank you for an older brother, Lord, who we pray will be a wonderful example to his younger brother through the years. We commit their needs to you in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. Theo, you were perfect, all right? Have you all gotten your pictures or do we need more? All right, we, all right, before we all move? Okay, here we go. Theo, I'm gonna go. Oh, you don't want to? Okay, I'll just keep you, I'll, I'll just keep you, I'll just keep you with me. There we go. Oh, Derev. Hey, big brother. Good job, man. Give me five. <laughs> you left me hanging, man. You psyched me. I have a special 
two gifts for you. One, certificate, all right, that you could put in the baby book, and uh, somewhere down the road, he'll look at it and say, what did you guys do to me that day? And then also for his enjoyment, though he might be getting a little big for this now, we have a blanket done by our women's quilting group around here, and it's got a note on here that says, given to you with love and just something for him to enjoy, and it's got soccer balls on it, okay? All right, there we go, and it's the right color, okay? We did good today. God bless you all. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, and James Atterbury, are you in the room? Did I, I thought I saw you over there. Okay. I have your Bible back for you. I'm doing this so I don't forget. James was baptized last Sunday and wanted a little something put in his Bible honoring that day. So we did. You bet. I'm going to ask our rushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering, and then we'll get engaged in our worship today. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for the joy of of trusting you. Thank you for the privilege of being your child. Um, Lord, the scripture says that you have one and only son, but it's by the gift of that one and only son that you give to each and every one of us the privilege of becoming your adopted sons and daughters in your family. We couldn't be good enough to earn our way into your family, and we certainly could not be wealthy enough to buy our way into your family. But Father, you didn't want it done that way anyway. You offer to us a gift. It's the gift of eternal life in the person of your Son. And you tell us in the Scripture that if we accept your Son, then we become joint heirs with your one and only Son. And Father, what that means is everything that you gave to the Son, you're going to give to us. And so thank you for that privilege. And God... We have to choose to want to be adopted by you. It's not because of where we're born or, again, how much good we can do. We have to recognize that we have a need to be loved by an eternal God, that we have a need for someone to come live in us who can bring us peace and joy and contentment. We must recognize that there, if there's anything after death, we've got to figure that out, and you figured it out for us. It's called resurrection. And you offer us your presence in our life in the here and now, and you offer us a forever home in the Father's house in the forever there and then. So thank you for that privilege. And Lord, if there's anybody here today who's never made the choice to accept your offer of adoption, I, I hope they know they don't have to wait till a sermon is preached. They don't even have to do it in church. It could be on the way home. But at some point in time, there has to be this moment that we say, God, I want you. I invite you in. Thank you for the gift that you Thank you for paying for all the adoption uh, demands. And all I need to do is accept you. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing this time with our church family and friends and new friends that we've never met before today. I trust that we'll allow you to meet our deeds. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing, Father. We commit all this to you in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I forgot to say this. Walmart cards. How many of you read my email? Okay. What these are all about. We have two families connected to our church who have been devastated by fires in the last two weeks, all right? One was an apartment fire, and the other was a home fire, and uh, pretty much wiped out everything that they had. So as things are being set up for them, what we're going to do is collect Walmart cards, all right? You can bring any denomination you want to, uh, $25, $50, $100. We figured Walmart was a great place because it's got food, clothing, housing supplies, and furniture, all right, and so whatever their needs are, we're going to help them with. If you say, Tim, I didn't read my email, then if you want to put a little something extra in today, just, just put it in an envelope and write on it, fire, all right? And we'll go buy the Walmart cards, all right? And we're going to distribute it in between the two families, all right? So thank you, Shelly, for that reminder. And uh, you can either drop the Walmart cards in the offering, you can drop your check or cash in the offering, or if the offering gets by before you have a chance to do anything, you can hand it to one of the ushers on your way out today and we'll see that it's taken care of. Thank you very much. One, two, three. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thanks. I invite you, uh, if you'd like, to turn to the book of Philippians, all right? The epistle of the Philippians, chapter four. We're going to pick up where we were. 
uh, two weeks ago. Now, for those of you who weren't here two weeks ago, or for those of you who have slept since then, uh, we'll remind you, we'll do a little review of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, all right? So if you would turn to Philippians chapter 4, we'll be reading from there in a few minutes. Uh, again, if you're new or you've been gone for a little while, welcome back and welcome for the very first time. We're involved in a series uh, all summer long called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much, you can only have too little. And we spent the first several weeks looking at laughter, found out that the Bible has a lot to say, actually, about laughter. And we want to, there's this idea that when you become a Christian, you can't laugh as much anymore. And that is so sad, all right? It might come from the expression on people's face in church on Sunday mornings. I'm not sure where that idea got around, but we often, we need to learn that it's okay to laugh. And so we looked at the fact that God even laughs. And now we've transitioned to looking at really what the source of that laughter is, and that comes from this incredible word called joy. We just sang about it, actually, in this last song. And so we're looking at what the Bible has to say about this fountain of joy that God places in our heart at the moment that we become a Christian. And uh, we're learning our first few principles out of the epistle that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. It's important to remember that when Paul wrote these words, he was incarcerated. He was under Roman arrest. He had chains on his wrists, and he was confined to a residence, to a house. It was a house arrest, but he had chains from his wrists to the guard that was in the other room. So life was not going great for Paul as he writes these words. And I think it's important for us to know that as we read what he had to say. Um, there's an old story uh, about an older couple that was having dinner at a restaurant together. The wife sees another couple across the restaurant about their same age, and they're sitting in a booth. She sees the husband sitting on the same side of the table as his wife, very close. He's got his arm around her, and he's whispering sweet things in her ear, so much so that the, the wife is, is blushing just a bit. And um, he's gently rubbing her shoulder and touching her hair. This particular woman turns to her husband and says, Look at that couple over there. Look how close that man sits to his wife. Notice he's talking to her. Look how sweet it is. Why don't you ever do that? Her husband looks up from a Caesar salad, glances over at the booth, and then he turns to his wife and says, Well, honey, why would I do that? I've never met that woman. <laughs> See, it is okay to laugh. It was a man who was... Um, talking to a psychiatrist at his appointment. And he said to his doctor, he said, Doc, I've been misbehaving and my conscience is bothering me. And the doctor responded to him and said, Oh, so, so you would like me to, to tell you something that will strengthen your willpower? And replied, the man replied, No, Doc, I was thinking of something that would weaken my conscience. <laughs> that would be funnier if it wasn't so true. You see, what we often feed our minds and our hearts determines whether we live with covetousness and envy or whether we live with contentment and peace. And that is what this passage in the book of Proverbs is all about, is about contentment, joy, and peace. Let me take just a couple of moments and review what we talked about two weeks ago we didn't preach last week because we, uh, we had 17 baptisms, and uh, Rick got to speak, all right, uh, Sunday morning. Didn't he do a good job? If you run into Rick, tell him that's his uh, first time to preach in big church, all right, on Sunday morning, and uh, I thought he did just a terrific job. So you'll get to hear from him again down the road. But we've been looking at what it means to be content in the joy that Jesus has provided for us, and we've noticed that in this book of Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 10 to the end of the chapter, that God gives us at least five keys to contentment. And the first one that we looked at was that we need to learn how to relax in God's sufficiency, uh, to just be at ease that God is enough for whatever it is that we face in life. You see, relaxing in God's sufficiency is foundational to us learning how to be content. And two weeks ago, we looked at a lot of verses that talk about the subject of contentment, but let me throw one more out at you today. It's from the mouth of Jesus himself when he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, come to me if you're tired and weary. Come to me if you're frustrated and stressed out with life, and I will give you rest 
for your soul. In the midst of a troubled mind and mixed emotions and a will that doesn't know which way to go, Jesus says, come to me and in me find rest for your soul. So you and I must learn the secret of relaxing in God's sufficiency. Second of all, we need to learn to rest in what God provides. All right? Um, Resting in God's promises. The Scripture says a lot about abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in us and about how we are to learn to to rest with where we are uh, and with what we have. The third key is we need to refuse to let circumstances dictate our joy. We often equate joy and happiness as the same thing, and we must remember that joy has its spring, its source in Jesus Christ. Happiness has its source out of what is happening around us. So they are not one and the same. So we can be joy-filled and not be happy. We can sometimes not be happy with what's happening to us or around us, but while we are experiencing this sense of unhappiness about our circumstances, we can still experience the joy of Christ knowing that the events cannot steal my joy. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for why our circumstances aren't good. Have any of you ever had moments in your life where you were your own worst enemy? Has that ever happened to you? I'm not the only one. So there there are things that we sometimes do in our life that we did to ourselves. Now, sometimes we want to blame God, right? Because it's his fault, not mine. But when we look in the mirror, we know we did it. For example, I'll pick on something easy that nobody will take offense to today. You ever go 85 on the freeway? (laughs) No, not me. Yeah, we have three CHPs in the building right now, all right? Just I'll let you know. All right, most of us, we've got 80, 85 down the freeway, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwittingly, all right? Uh, and so if a CHP pulls us over, do we have any reason to be mad at anybody else? No, we, we did that, all right? We did that on our own. Now, you ever go 74 in a 70 and get pulled over and get a ticket and get mad? Okay, and you might think you had the right to, but you don't. Because that's just makeup for all those times you went 85 and didn't get caught, all right? So you had no reason to be mad in the first place. It, it, it is what it is. But some, see, we, we caused that. We did that. Now, there are other experiences in life in which somebody else did something stupid, and they brought pain into our world. We had nothing to do with it. We were a bystander. We were collateral damage, and we got impacted And then there are other reasons in our life that we have, or other events in our life that we have no reason for. We don't know why this circumstance, this event, this tragedy happened. An earthquake, a tornado, a hurricane. We didn't do anything to cause any of those, but we may be swept up in the consequences or the effects of those things. Cancer. Okay? My, my mother died of a rare disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin. It gives you cirrhosis of the liver and emphysema. My mother was a teetotaler. She was raised by a Baptist preacher, and because of that, she never drank a drop of alcohol in her life. The worst thing she had was NyQuil, about the only alcohol content she had in her life, let she ended up with cirrhosis of the liver. She ended up with emphasis. She never smoked one time. That Baptist preacher, father of hers, um, he was going to quit those Popeye things every month, all right? And he smoked until he died of a heart attack. Now, if my mother had been a smoker all her life, if my mother had been a drinker all of her life, we could understand emphysema and we could understand cirrhosis of the liver, right? She didn't do either one of those things, and yet that was the cause of her death. So there are things that happen in our lives that we have absolutely no control over, no reason to explain. God says, don't let your joy be connected to the events of your life, whether they were self-imposed because you were own worst enemy, whether the result of somebody else doing something foolish and you might be part of the collateral damage, or you have no idea where this came from. 
Jesus said, your joy is not dependent upon those events, but your relationship with me. Try to imagine facing any one of those three events out of your own ability, your own strength, your own resources, and with no hope of God's presence in your life now as you go through the trouble or when the end result of those circumstances is your death, knowing that you're not going to heaven. So God offers us his presence in our life as we go through the valley of the shadow of trouble. He never tells us we won't have trouble, but he says, I will be with you in the midst of that trouble. And if we will trust him in the midst of that trouble, even if we're the cause of our own destruction, God says, I'll provide a way of escape for you. God says, I'll have a plan that will help you get from where you are to where I want you to be. Those are the promises that God gives to us, and that's why our joy is not dependent upon the events that are going on around us, but the source of this person who lives within us. And and one of the primary reasons that most of us don't experience this kind of joy in our life is because we don't know the promises of God. You can't experience what you don't know. Um, In the last service, Dick Kelton um, as I got up to preach, said, hey, Tim, you need to tell everybody about that new bright red pickup you're driving. Which I really wasn't going to tell a soul about the new bright red pickup that I'm driving. Although I am driving one today. Now, let me tell you this, because you heard me talk about Shelly and I who did not buy a new truck. I'm driving a little electric car around town because of the building program, and that is true. We were waiting for God's timing, God's opportunity. I knew this truck might be available somewhere in the future. I was expecting another year, but we got the call two weeks ago. My uncle purchased one in 09. No, in in 10. 010. (laughs) He purchased it in 2010. It was a 2011 model, brand new. He bought it right off the showroom floor. It has spent every night in the garage until Shelly and I bought it. All right? And uh, we've made two quick trips uh, out of town, so it's sat in a parking lot two nights. Um, But this car, is it's 10 years old, and it had 71,000 miles on it, and it looks brand new. It's gorgeous. It's not my color of preference. My mother would be so happy I was driving a red truck because her favorite dress was a bright red dress. She would wear it and come down the aisle and say, Mama's coming. (coughs) And um, so anyway, I I, I ended up with this, this, this car, and I'm so thrilled. It's exciting. But here's the deal. If I'd bought that car, that truck brand new from the dealer, and six months later, I was having problems with the engine, if I hadn't read the paperwork with that truck to know that it's got a five-year warranty from bumper to bumper, and I took that brand new truck just six months old with new engine trouble, and I took it down to my corner mechanic and asked him to fix it for me, and he gave me a bill of $600, The reason I would be doing that is because I hadn't read the paperwork. I didn't know what the guarantee, the warranty on that vehicle is. And so now I'm paying out of my own resources for something that I didn't need to pay for. It was provided when I bought the truck. The same thing happens in a lot of our lives as Christians. We don't read the paperwork We don't find out what is in here, so we don't know the benefit of the one who lives in here. I've had people over the years, people tell me, "Uh, Tim, I wished I could hear God speak the way you do. Do you know how I hear God speak? I read the paperwork. God is never going to say anything to me in here that he hasn't written in here. And so what I have to do is I have to get... um, I have to get these principles from here to here so that when I am in a situation in life and I need to make a decision, the Holy Spirit in my life can bring to my remembrance the biblical principle or truth that's in here. It doesn't jump from here to here without reading it. And so I need to, God doesn't always tell me the address. I don't remember every single address of every scripture in the Bible. But God brings the words of that scripture at just the right moment, the principle that we need. And so if we're not living in the joy and the contentment that Paul is talking about here, and he said, remember, I'm learning to do this, 
learning, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but one who can rightly divide, apply, use in their life the word of truth. Charles Spurgeon. Um, do, do, when I, I throw names out, and sometimes I don't realize if people know who I'm talking about or not. Uh, it's like now when I mention the actor's name, Paul Newman. Anybody under 35 says, he's an actor? I thought he made salad dressing. <laughs> so, Charles Spurgeon. If I say the name Charles Spurgeon, how many of you know who I'm talking about? How many of you have no idea who I'm talking about? And it's okay to raise your hand. Okay, great. All right. So let me just br brief explain. Charles Spurgeon was uh, a pastor in London, England, back in the 1800s. Okay? Um, ten, the, um, what I'm going to tell you is he was a mega church, pastor of a mega church before anybody knew what a mega church was. 10,000 people showed up every Sunday morning to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England to hear Charles Spurgeon preach. This guy was phenomenal. He had a voice that was booming and need to because they didn't have amplification systems in churches. They built, one of the reasons the churches were built so big in those days, both Protestant and Catholic in, the, in, the, in Eastern countries, is because they had to have their own natural PA system in it. They had to be able to bounce off the walls. And Spurgeon had this voice that would carry all the way outside because people outside were standing there to hear the sermon because they couldn't get in. The most treasured books I have in my library is a three-volume set called The Treasury of David, written by Charles Spurgeon, and it's on one book of the Bible. It's on the Psalms. It's my most treasured possession in my library. And so when I quote Spurgeon, I'm quoting a guy that 50 years after his death, the world gave him the title of the Prince of Preachers. And the other reason I really loved Charles Haddon Spurgeon is because he loves cigars. So, <laughs> but here's what Spurgeon said. He said, you say, if I had a little more, I would be very satisfied. But you would be making a mistake. If you are not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. I think he's right. There was a pilot who all was looking down intently on a certain valley in the Appalachians. And his co-pilot said, what's so interesting in that spot? You've flown over it three times. And the pilot said, well, you see that stream down there? When I was a kid, I used to sit there on that log and fish. And every time an airplane would fly overhead, I would look up and wish I were flying. And now I'm flying and I look down and I wish I were fishing. That pretty well sums up the way we are about life, isn't it? Sometimes even though we do get what we want, we're not still satisfied. Everybody wants more. A little child wants more toys and more TV. A teenager wants more clothes, freedom, popularity. Most adults want more also. A nicer house, a newer car, a red pickup, more prestige. <laughs> and often we get more. We get that car of our dreams, and we are content for a while. We buy that dream home, and we're content for a while. The job we always wanted comes knocking at our door. Great pay, incredible benefits, and we are content for a while. One of God's prophets wrote the following words to God's people about 2,500 years ago in the book of Haggai when he said, you have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you're not full. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you're never warm enough. You earn money, and then you lose it as if you put it in a purse or your pockets that are full of holes. You expected much, but you discover it turned out to be little. Let's go back to Philippians 4, verses 10 through 23, and find out the last two keys. Paul wrote, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. At last, you've renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. 
And I've discovered the secret of being content in the circumstances that I really like. Did I read that correctly? No. Not in the circumstances I like. Paul said in any and every circumstance. Remember, he's incarcerated and chained. He said, I know what it's like to be well-fed and hungry. I know what it's like to live in affluence or plenty and to be needy or in want. I can do everything through him who is my strength. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. That's the only church that supported his missionary work. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to, to your account. I want to give you recognition. I've received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I have received gifts from Epaphroditus. The gifts that you sent, they are a fragrant and acceptable sacrifice. They're pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The fourth principle that leads to joy in our heart is relying on God's strength. Verse 13 refers to having God's strength as we endure all of our trials in life, whether we have much or whether we have little, whether things are going good or whether things are going bad. Our challenges might not be things like hunger or scarcity, but the principle of relying on God's strength is just as important for contentment today as it was for Paul back then. Paul got through his difficulties with contentment because he chose to rely upon God's resources. By his own testimony, he said, I can do everything or anything through him who is the source of my strength. But what does this really mean to rely upon God's presence and power in us? Well, I've learned from the school of hard knocks that if I'm doing things in my own strength, I have a tendency to become frustrated more often, more quickly, and it lasts longer. I tend to discover that I'm stressed out about what other people are going to think about what I'm doing and what the results are of what I've done. But if I'm doing things in the presence and the strength of the one who lives within me, Christ Jesus, things seem to flow a bit more naturally. For example, when I'm writing a sermon, like for today, I can tell the difference if I'm doing this out of my own mind and personality and what little talent God has given me or whether I'm doing it out of God's strength in me. When I do it on my own, I labor over every word. Sometimes what I've discovered is it's not the words that are the problem. It's the attitude of the one writing those words. Out of the flesh, I want to make sure that when I turn a phrase, it sounds good. I'm thinking about, are people going to go, wow, when they hear it? But when I'm working out of the Spirit, I'm thinking more about how you are going to hear what's being said. It's not about me. God, what do you want them to hear from you? Now, this is not to suggest that doing things in God's strength will always be easy. It isn't. I, I will tell you this. There have been times I prepared a sermon. It's all finished, buttoned up, done. I'm really happy with it Friday afternoon. I go home saying it's going to be a great weekend. I don't need to give this another thought. I go to bed Saturday night, and I wake up at 3.30 in the morning. And there's a thought in my head. Now, I know I am not the originator of that thought because I was asleep. And that thought nags at me, and I can't go back to sleep. And so I get up, and I get in the shower, and I say, oh, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to tweak that sermon a little bit. And while I'm standing in a shower, an entire outline just floods it. It's kind of like the shower's pouring over my head. There are these thoughts that just flow into my mind, and I hurry up to the office, and I scrap the sermon I thought was so good on Friday. And all of a sudden, here is a message that I had no intention of preaching, had no knowledge about, and all of a sudden, boom, it's right there. That doesn't happen often. But you have to pay attention what it does. But that's when you know God is at work in your life. See, always doing God's will is not always easy, but it ought to be restful. <laughs> we shouldn't be stressed by it. Here's what's not easy. It's not easy to ask forgiveness for somebody you've offended. Overcoming a bad habit is not easy. 
Learning to think good and godly thoughts first isn't easy. Allowing sorrow to be transformed to joy has its challenges. And most of the challenges come from my jealous fleshly nature. My fleshly nature wants to sound good, wants to look good, and most important of all, it wants to be in charge. It wants to have the final say. It wants to be in control. Paul captures this idea when he writes about his own thorn in the flesh when he wrote a letter to a church called the church at Corinth. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take this problem from my life, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, my frustrations, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then he is strong." Sometimes we experience God's strength in ways that make things go more smoothly, like when I write a sermon. Other times we experience God's strength in ways that make us more resilient through the troubled times, like when Paul wrestled with this thorn in the flesh. Either way, relying on God's strength will add greatly to our level of contentment. Relying on God is better than relying on somebody else. There was a man in a hot air balloon who realized he was lost. He had reduced his altitude, and he spotted a woman in her backyard below. He descended a bit closer, and he shouted out to her so she could hear him, Excuse me, can you help me? I promised a friend I'd meet him an hour ago, but I don't know where I am. The woman below replied, Sir, you were in a hot air balloon hovering approximately 30 feet above the ground. You are between the 40 and 41st degree latitude and 59 to 60 degree longitude. The balloonist replied, you must be an engineer. She replied, I am. How did you know? Well, answered the balloonist, everything you told me is technically true, but I have no idea what to make of that information. And the fact is, I'm still lost. Frankly, you've not been of much help at all. If anything, you've delayed my trip. The woman below responded, you must be in upper management. I'm apologizing now to those of you in management. All right, I'm so sorry. He said, I am, but how did you know? And she said, well, you don't know where you are or where you're going. You've risen to where you are due to a large quantity of hot air. (laughs) You made a promise, but you've no idea how to keep, and you expect people beneath you to solve your problems. Fact is, you are in exactly the same position you were before we met, but somehow it's my fault. How does that help anybody? If we start blaming others, getting technical for every disappointment, bad circumstance, troubled environment we go through, can you and I learn to be less historical and hysterical, citing every infraction, feeling every slight as an offense punishable by death? Can we begin to learn to be content as we rest and rely upon God's strength? See, one of the keys to contentment in our work and finding fulfillment in every area of our life is learning to be thankful for what we've been given. Wanting to move forward in your own career is not a problem unless it means that you take where you are for granted. As one person once wrote, if you are not thankful for what you've got, it's doubtful if you'll be thankful for what you get. Contentment and peace is found in a thankful heart. G.K. Chesterton, and I don't have time to tell you who he is, but he's another guy from a previous generation who said when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. So let me review real quickly. First key is relax in God's sufficiency. Second, rest in what God provides. Third, refuse to let circumstances dictate your joy. Four, rely on God's strength. And last of all, Release your resources generously. In verses 14 through 19, Paul thanks the Philippians for their financial support for his life and missionary work. They've given multiple times. It had been a while since the last time, but he was most grateful for not only the past, but for the present. Undoubtedly, the people at Philippi learned the generosity of giving from Paul. He was the one who led most of them to Christ. He was their first pastor. For better or for worse, It has been observed 
all right, and those in church circles, the churches began to reflect the heart and passion of their pastor. And the Philippians became a generously giving church because their founding pastor Paul impressed upon them that love always gives. And let me tell you that my pastor impressed upon me that you can't outgive the Lord. My pastor is still here today. He'll turn 94 next week. For those of you who don't know, my dad was my pastor my entire life. The church I pastor now was a church he started in 1965. And I learned from watching my dad at home and listening to my dad at church that you never can outgive God. Someone once said that you can give without love, but you cannot love without giving. Think about the next time an offering is passed. Give generously may be one of the least talked about keys to commitment, contentment. Some of the most contented Christians I've met are those who are the most generous. So as I wrap up this morning, I want you to underlie a phrase in your Bible. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Once we learn to be content, we'll begin to experience these rushing rivers of God-inspired joy. But I think Paul sees the word secret. He uses the word secret because contentment is not something everybody learns. It is available to every believer. But sadly, not all of us find it. So what's the secret? Relax in God's sufficiency. Said another way, I'm okay with where I am and where it is that God wants to take me. Number two, rest in what God provides. Another way of saying that, I'm okay with what I have and what God gives me. Refuse to let circumstances dictate your joy. Another way to say that, I may not like what's happening at the moment, but I will trust God's will and timing for the future. Number four, rely on God's strength. I'm willing to learn to let God do it in me and through me. Number five, release your resources generously. Another way to say it, I want to give like Jesus gives because I want to love like Jesus loves. If we will do that, we will be able to answer the question, got joy? With a resounding yes. Let me close with this. There was one kind of contentment that is very, very wrong. I remember this story. Actually, it wasn't a story. It was a skit. I'm pretty confident it was at Hume Lake. If it wasn't at Hume, it was at Heartland Christian Camp. I went to both of those through my teenage years. But I remember this skit. They had a fence on the stage, and they had a girl sitting on the fence. Someone tried to convince her to give her life to Christ and to become a Christian, but she wouldn't budge off the fence. Someone else tried to lead this young lady through temptation into open, indulgent, flagrant sin. But she wouldn't do that either. She was content to sit on the fence. And then she died. And the day of judgment came. And Jesus came to receive the believers to himself. And Satan came for the ones who had been tempting all the believers. And then Satan returned for the fence sitter. She tried to explain to him how, hey, no, I didn't get saved. I didn't get on that side of the fence, but, but I also didn't give in to all those temptations there either. And Satan said, no, you didn't. But what you didn't know is I own the fence. There's one kind of contentment that will not do any of us any good. And that's to sit on the fence. Jesus said, either be hot in your love for me or don't love me at all. Because lukewarm, fence sitting, the fence is owned by Satan. If you're a Christian and you're lacking contentment today, I would suggest to you the primary reason for that is you're not reading the paperwork. It could be you're not obeying the paperwork. But for most of us, it's because we're not, we're not reading it. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, and you'd like to have joy that's not dependent upon yourself or your circumstances, 
There's no special prayer, no secret formula, just an honest confession of the heart. God, I need you. Drum with me as we close in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for the time to spend this day with our church family and our friends and new friends. Thank you for dedicating a baby to your love, your care, your future. Father, most of all, thank you for the challenge that your word brings to each of our hearts. Sometimes that challenge is, is, is for encouragement. Sometimes that challenge is for discipline. Sometimes that challenge is educational. Sometimes that challenge is to remind us of the fellowship that you want to have with us. Lord, you want to be the, the dynamic thrust behind our faith, behind our love, behind our hope. You want to be that dynamic thrust for the contentment and peace that can be ours. But in order for us to experience what you've promised, we've got to know the promises. So, Father, thank you for hearing our prayers today. For those who might be praying to invite you in their life, thank you. You, you hear every prayer. You're available 24-7 to hear those prayers. For those who may be believers and they're acknowledging there's something that's created interference in the relationship, a lack of the paperwork, or, Father, we've just ignored your voice in our heart, but we don't want to ignore anymore. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We commit this day and the remainder of our life on this earth to you, and we do so in the name of Christ. Amen. Don't move. Would the real horns please stand? They have been married one week and a day now. One week and a day. God bless you. Congratulations. And John certainly married up. All right. God bless you. You can move now. Yeah.